Hey, what's going on guys? This is Kalen Chalk and today we're going to do something a little bit different here. Um, I'm going to um, provide you guys with a talk that I have done for the past couple of years um, throughout the country and throughout the world whenever I go uh, doing workshops with some of my friends with Robot Pencil. Um, the reason why I'm doing this is because I think it's time to kind of retire this talk in general. Um, as most of you guys know, I just recently got married this past weekend. And um, as I'm kind of turning a new chapter, I think it's time for me to kind of just um, close certain doors and also open new things and see what new opportunities kind of come. So um, today I want to just kind of um, provide you with this talk. And um, for me, this talk was always kind of a, one of my favorite ones to do at workshops, um, I think, because many people could relate to it. Um, there is no drawing or painting. Um, it's mostly going to be about just kind of my journey of how I got to where I am. And hopefully, if you like this, I, I just encourage you to share it with um, with someone that may be going through a similar situation, whether you're just starting or maybe you're already, you know, kind of in the industry and you're going through certain problems that life can kind of bring you. Um, I hope that this can kind of bring you some kind of uh, positive uh, influence in your life. OK, so again, as usual, thank you guys so much for the support and let's uh, get into it. So. Becoming an artist, though, I could probably say this is probably long since changed that word artist or for me, I should probably just call it growing up and things that I've learned since I've been in the industry. So let's get into it. So we're going to take a step back here um, to back pretty much like 2005 when I was my first year in art school. So that's, that's where we're going to start in terms of the premise. So uh, let's get started with that. So art school year one, 2006. So this is me right here. I kind of drew that out and I'm just going to put this level here. Um, this is kind of a, like kind of a video game analogy. So that way we can understand where I'm coming from in terms of skill. So my very first year, I went to the Art Institute of California, Orange County. And so, you know, someone came to my school and said, hey, you can make games. And I thought that would be really, really cool. I should you know, get into that. Is there that or try to be a soccer player? And even though I was pretty good at soccer, um, this one just felt more fun to me than to actually kind of grind out and try to become a professional soccer player. So I knew that I wanted to work in games and that was me at 19 years old. And that's me at level one. Very, very important. So I knew I wanted to work in games, but if you guys know what that means, there's a lot of things you can do within the game, within the game industry. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I just knew that kind of over underlying under overlying statement was that I wanted to be in games. So I knew what I wanted to do, but I did not know what I, what I wanted to do. Um, so I didn't know if I wanted to be a concept artist, an animator, a modeler, but that's why you go to school to kind of figure those things out. Uh, I didn't know what success looked like. And this is kind of an important one for me because I didn't have any friends or family that were, per, that were professional um, in, the art, in the art field. So usually my sister was a gymnast. My brother was a fighter pilot in the Air Force. So if I ever wanted to become like a gymnast or a fighter pilot, I could just look at my brother and my sister and be like, okay, look at what they're doing to be successful. I should just do that. So I didn't know what success looked like. I didn't know what a successful concept artist looked like. So a lot of times I had to guess. And so when I had to guess, I thought it was like high school. And for me, when I was in high school, I just copied my friends. And that was kind of how I got by. Um, I had to get good grades so I wouldn't get grounded because I wanted to play soccer. I wanted to chase girls. I wanted to go out. And so a lot of times I just made sure that I just hung around the smart people and I kind of just copied them. Whatever they did, I would do it. Whatever answer they got, that's what I got. And I was able to get by for four years, um, you know, pretty much just copying my friends, not not cheating. Well, I guess cheating, too. But for the most part, was kind of just bending the rules and just doing whatever I could. So I didn't have to work super, super hard. That was kind of my goal in high school was not to work hard, just to do enough to get by so that I wouldn't get grounded and so that I could just, you know, enjoy my time with my friends. And so my first year in high school, our first year in art college, um, was pretty much me playing Third Strike. <laughs> and so if anyone knows Street Fighter 3 Third Strike, that's a really fun game. I played that all the time. So on breaks, I would go play it. Um, <clears throat> I'd be late to class because I'd be playing video games. Because that's what I thought. I was like, hey, I'm working in the video game industry. I used to make the excuse of, yeah, this is this is my industry, so I got to play games, right? And so that was me, uh, level one, playing some Third Strike. And those were other people that were higher levels, levels than me. And they were just like, does this guy ever work? Because it just seems like he's just always playing video games and he's never practicing. But again, I didn't know what success looked like. There wasn't anyone that was a senior at my school that I knew that was becoming a concept artist. Because again, 
I didn't know what I wanted to do. So as you can see, all these problems kind of compounded onto each other. And that led me to kind of where I was in my first year, which wasn't very good. So if we can kind of fast forward here to my second year of art school, that's when a lot of things changed for me. So this is 2007. Uh, I ended up meeting a guy named Edgar Cardona. And I'll probably leave a link um, to these people's works in case you're kind of interested in that. And one day I see this guy named Edgar Cardona. And so this is kind of a, a very cartoon rendition. Edgar, if you're watching this, I apologize. Um, he was painting this tree. And it was like this black and white tree with a little bit of color. And it was so cool. And I was like, how did you paint that? And that's when he showed me the Wacom tablet for the first time. Mind you, I was kind of just drawing Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z and stuff like that and drawing stuff for my friends in high school. So I thought I was a pretty good artist because my mom told me so. My friends told me so. Um, the recruiter told me so because they wanted my money. <laughs> and so I was like, sure. And Edgar was level five and he was already doing, you know, pretty decent art for someone who's a, you know, a freshman um, in college. And then I met uh, Anthony Jones. That's AJ. So. Uh, by the way, Anthony Jones was actually very, very skinny when I met him. I just draw the dumbbells because it's just freaking hilarious to draw it. But um, the first thing I remember eating when I met AJ was, why is this guy's voice so deep? But also, how did you paint that? And so Edgar and AJ became some of my best friends um, when I was in art school, and I was still level one. And so I saw what they were doing. And to kind of go back to the uh, other image here, we talked about how we didn't know what success looked like. I was now able to kind of understand what I thought success looked like in school because now I see people doing it. So by surrounding myself, right, with other people, I can see what it looks like. Just like in high school, I was surrounding myself with smart people. I could kind of see what they're doing. And I'm like, if I just mimic that, I could probably get by. <laughs> and again, that was the mentality that I had uh, going through art school. So eventually when I saw these guys paint, I realized, I said, hey, this is what I want to do. Like, whatever they're doing, can I get paid to do this? And my teacher told me, yeah, you can get paid to, to paint um, on a Wacom tablet. And I said, sweet, that's exactly what I want to do. So I thought, well, all I got to do is just hang around these guys, right? Because that's what I did in high school was just hang around smart people and things will probably work out. So I learned what I wanted to do, but I wasn't taken seriously. And I made hardworking friends, but didn't work hard myself because I still had that art. I still had that high school mentality. So if I had to look at all of my friends, like an RPG, here's some people saying he's an art groupie. I was that guy in art school that was pretty much like he hangs around these badass people, but he's not badass, right? He's like, he's okay. He's just that guy that hangs around, but he's not really good. He doesn't really work hard. And I'm sure some of you guys may feel like you're in this position. And if you are, it's definitely okay because there is hope for you. And so um, when I realized I was there, it was definitely a hard pill to swallow because, again, I was like, hey, I hang out with these people, but people kind of wouldn't acknowledge me in conversations. I don't know if you've been there before where, like, you want to, like, have an opinion about something or you want to say something. People kind of look at you like, who the hell are you to be talking? You level two artists. Let's just listen to what these people say because they're really, really good. And that's kind of how I felt. I kind of felt like I was invisible. And I'm sure if you're a beginning artist and you happen to be working next to better artists, it's very easy to feel like you don't matter, um, which is totally far from the truth. And so these are some of my friends at the time. <clears throat> that was uh, AJ, Buff AJ. He wasn't that buff back in the day. There was Edgar. There was Teddy. There was uh, Mio. And there was Nino. And so all these guys. So Teddy Wright was also an amazing artist. Uh, Nino uh, Aguilar, um, an amazing artist as well, and uh, Mio Del Rosario, another amazing concept artist. All these guys still currently doing work in the industry and all badass. And here I was, the lowly level two guy that just felt like just a complete outsider. And it, just didn't, it didn't feel good, right, as you can obviously understand. And again, I couldn't understand why because I was like, man, I got, I got by for like four years doing this in uh in high school right why is it why is it not working right now and again this took me a while to kind of really understand what needed to change in my life in order for me to kind of be be successful okay so something happened to me um in that second year and it was kind of one of the defining moments i feel like in my art career where people said hey you know when did you realize like 
yo, you can do this. Or like, when did you realize like this may not be for me? Everyone kind of has that turning point of a story in their life of where things could have went a completely different direction, but they end up going a direction that was meant for your life in terms of being in terms of being positive. So um, in that same year of 2007, and again, this is kind of a long time ago because we're obviously this is like 10 years ago. Um, back then, this is before Gumroads, before, you know, Patreons, before, um, kind of before YouTube is still in its infant stages. We didn't have any of the crazy schools that we have now. Um, one of the coolest things at school was to go on a field trip to a studio. Because at that point, you had no clue what studio life was like unless someone invited you to the studio. All you all you could do was hear stories from your teachers. You could sometimes see DVDs and stuff like that. They don't have these kind of crazy events now where you can take tours of studios so much easier like they didn't have any of that stuff so to go on a field trip right to, to see a studio was like the holy grail because it felt like as a student if i go there i'm gonna learn all these cool tricks and tips and learn what i need to do to get a job all these things right so outside of my academic director's um uh uh office she had a little sign up that said there's a field trip and they were going to a place called high moon studios and this was Linda Linda Selheim. She now works for Autodesk, I believe. And um, sorry, Linda, for this kind of bad, uh, super bad rendering of you, but you're awesome. I love you to death if you still remember me. But um, it said, field trip, super cool people only. Now, I was close to graduating at that time. I had about a year left, and everyone previously before me uh, did not have that much time left. These people were still kind of in their, their first year, and I was still in my second year. So though I was the furthest along in school, I was the lowest number. So it felt even more embarrassing. Like I was like held back a little bit, you know? So if I were to go back here real quickly, um, I said, you know, I really want to go. I'm close to graduating. Can I please go, Linda? And she looked at my portfolio and she said, no. She was like, yeah, sorry, it's not going to happen. I don't think you should be a concept artist. I think you should probably get into modeling and texturing. You should do something else because this isn't for you. All right. And at the time, as much as I hated those words from her, she was right. My work was not very good, and but I took it personally. I didn't know how to um, explain my feelings for the most part. So, of course, those kind of came out as frustration of like, you suck, you know, she's a hater, whatever. Everyone's getting all the same because, except for me. And ironically, she was she she wasn't wrong. She was totally right in her assessment, because, again, she has to deal with with so many students a day and all she can really do is look at the surface and look at your work and and hopefully that work represents who you are as a person and who what, what you can do and to me my work was not rep representative of who i was and what i could do at least not yet and so for the first time i felt invisible and i felt like an outsider so i felt like that already but i felt even more like that and so this is not actually how it happened they actually drove their own cars but it kind of felt like that like I'm in the window looking down and everyone's getting on this bus and they're like, oh, my God, it's a once in a lifetime trip. So much fun and devastation population me. Right. I suck. And so it was one of the hardest things I had to deal with was watching all of my friends essentially go on a field trip without me. Right. And they're going to go get better because they're going to get experience. They're going to get all these things. And I'm still stuck at level two, right? And I'm like, why don't you help me? Because I suck, right? Like I'm level two, I should get some help. And it felt like because I wasn't good, teachers didn't want to invest in me because it was like, what's the point? Because he's not, he's he's definitely not there. So there's no point in giving these opportunities if he's, you know, level three. And so um, I was really sad. I was, I felt really, I was at school the entire day. They left early in the morning. Um, they came back later that night because it was about an hour drive away. But I was like, man, like I suck, like no one sees me. Like it just felt like it's, I felt invisible for the first time I've ever felt in my entire life. And this is for someone that kind of came from high school being kind of a jock, um, being not to be the center of attention, but, you know, playing sports and and being in the limelight and being around people, you know, like being somewhat popular for the most part. Um, from being that to being like all those things don't matter. All that matters is how you draw and, and using that as a way to measure my self-worth. Um, it wasn't worth that much, you know, and that was my mistake that I that I learned that we're going to talk about later. And so what made it even worse was when they came back, um, this is AJ and Edgar, everyone surrounded them, right? Everyone was like, yo, what the, oh, Edgar and AJ are back and Nino are back. 
and they're like, tell us about it. Tell us about the super feel, cool field trip. Your beard is epic. You guys are so good. Have my baby. Did he like your stuff? You're so cool. What's it like? All these people were surrounding them, and I could see that they that they kind of liked the attention a little bit. Meanwhile, I was over there in the corner of the room, and I kind of was I, I just felt I felt ignored, and I just felt like I wasn't there. And so imagine you feel like shit the entire day, <laughs> your friends. And, and by the way, these are my friends. And so I want to I want to feel happy for them. But at the same time, I'm like, man, I suck. I'm, I'm just not worth anything because I'm in the corner of this room. Everyone walks in this. These two walk in the room. And everyone's surrounding them, asking them questions. And I just feel like I'm not worth anything. And so that that feeling of like self-doubt and not feeling like I wasn't worth anything led to a lot of things, led to fear, led to anger. And for the first time while I was sitting there with my kind of head on the table, I just felt like maybe this wasn't for me. I thought that maybe I should pick an easier job. What if I don't make it? Um, maybe I should do something else. You can't do it. No one likes me. And and those doubt led to anger. It led to hate that I thought, you know, I hate my teachers, right? Because it's my teacher's fault that I couldn't go. If she would have let me go, then I would have got those opportunities and I could have been good. You know, I hate the school, right? It's the school's fault because the school should have more opportunities for me. They should have more classes for me. That's the reason I'm not good, right? And I said, no one cares, right? No one cares because if they cared, they, they, would, they would help me, right? And I said, it's not fair, right? It's not fair that I don't get these things that other people are getting. And I deserve those things, right? And then it went from fear to hate to blaming, right? That I felt invisible and they get all the attention. And when I went home that night, a, a, the pretty much the, the biggest thing that I ever thought was maybe I should just quit. And I really thought about that statement when I got home and it really kind of stuck with me. I thought maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I, I shouldn't be here. Like, what am I doing? You know, like I'm clearly not ready. I've wasted so much time. Like, what am I doing? And so I, I thought about it for a long time and I really thought that I won't be a real artist until people notice you. That's what I measured my self-worth as, right? I thought that if I'm not level nine and people don't recognize me and come in the room and, you know, shake my hand, that I'm not worth shit. That's, that's what I literally thought as a student. Again, I didn't know what success looked like. I didn't know what the road to being an artist was. There were so many things I was dealing with emotionally. I just freaking had no clue. And so I was prepared that that day to kind of walk in to my um, student advisor and tell her, you know, I don't, I don't think this is for me. Maybe I should do a different major, but maybe I should just go back to junior college. But like, I don't know what I want to do. And feeling like you don't belong or feeling invisible, like you don't have a purpose in this world is probably one of the worst feelings in the world. And I'm sure people, I'm sure some of you guys, as you're listening to this, you may have have dealt with that at some point in time where you feel like everyone just has their shit together, right? Everyone's getting internships. Everyone's getting job opportunities. Everyone's doing all these cool things. And you're just like, what am I doing? Like, I don't have any of those things. And so Today, it's probably even harder because there's social media, like Facebook was kind of just kind of coming around at that time. Um, Twitter wasn't really a thing yet. Neither was Instagram. And so we constantly see all these people just succeeding all the freaking time that it's hard to be like, well, wh what am I doing? And so, again, I really thought about quitting. And that's when um, I woke up the next day and kind of had a clear mind. And I thought, wait a minute. And I'm not sure what made me kind of like have this moment of clarity, to be honest. There wasn't really anything in particular that happened. I was talking to my girlfriend at the time and she was kind of encouraging as usual. But most times than not, your friends, family, spouses are kind of with that blind encouragement. where They're like, you can do anything you want, but they don't really know. And so I woke up the next day and as silly as that sounds, I thought, you know, like, who cares? Like, who cares? what the what people think of me and so from the years of um from the year of my art school year two to year three i realized that like you know what i don't care what people think of me and if i want to get better it's going to be on me and me alone so that way like if i screw up it's my fault and so i realized i was blaming people and i realized that that wasn't who my mother raised me to be because my mother 
and my father were really hardworking people. And they taught me a lot of things that what you get out of this world is what you make of it. Um, and if you don't get it, you have no one to blame but yourself. And that was kind of the, the, the mentality that I had. But I kind of lost that hardworking mentality as I went through art school. And so I said, you know what? I need to, if it's if I really want to do this, I got to show people that I can do it, right? Because people don't, people think that I'm still this level three artist and they're right. I am level three, but that's only right now, right? Tomorrow brings a new day and the day after that brings a new day. And I realized that there is potential within me that only I know. And I have to show that to others so that they can now see that and then view me differently, okay? So that's what I was trying to do is that though Linda, my academic director, was like, Kaylin, I don't think this is for you, I knew I could do it. I just needed time to show people that, hey, you can take me seriously. I know what's, I know what's, I know what's with inside me. I just need time to show that. And so Level Up Montage began. And so I would wake up from 10 a.m. to midnight almost every day, including the weekends, excluding Sundays because they were closed. And I would just draw and draw and draw and draw. And you could see me getting a little bit crazier, a little bit weirder, getting a little more straggly. <laughs> I discovered Red Bulls. And I was like, must go deeper. And I literally didn't do anything. I gained a little bit of weight because I stopped working out. But I was just so determined to, to show people um, that I could do it, which seems a little bit counterproductive because I said, you know, I shouldn't care what people think of me. And I didn't. But I wanted to, to prove to them, also prove to myself that if I put my mind to something, that I could do it. Because keep in mind, before that, I never quit anything in my life. And I wasn't going to start now. And so I kept working and working and working. And I kept leveling up. And then I became that straggly man beard that you see before you. To the point where people would ask me to go do stuff. And I would simply kind of just, you know, look at them. And then look away. And that's all I would do. Someone would say, hey, Kaylin, do you want to go to the movies? And I would just kind of look at him like that and then look at you and then look back down. I always do this in the workshops, by the way, people people laugh for some, whatever reason. I just think it's funny. And people be like, and my girlfriend at the time was like, Kaylin, you don't spend enough time with me. I don't think it's going to work out. And again, I would just look at her and then I would just look back at you guys. And I was like, I don't have time for that. And then my friends would be like, hey, do you want to go to the club? Because before that, I used to love going to the club. And again, I would just look at him. And then look at it over there and be like, nah, man, it's time to work. And that's all I did, guys. I worked and worked and worked for a year. That's all I could do at that point. All I could do is put it in my own in my own hands. And I worked. I lost some friends. I lost some loved ones that didn't want to, like, hang out with me, that didn't want to support my new kind of, like, you know, work ethic. And that's totally fine because not everyone's, you know, meant to be there for you in that way. But I worked my butt off, right? I just drew. And I drew and I drew. And I didn't do anything, right? I realized how lucky I was. I realized that there's always going to be someone that has it worse. And so that I have to make the best of what I, of what I can. I had to make the best attempt of what I have before me. And so I realized how lucky I was because I lived in California. I lived in Southern California of all places. I was around all these studios and around all these artists that if I wanted to learn something from someone, I had to go and ask. And I had to be a little bit more... Um, a little bit more, not pushy, but I had to be a little more, take a little bit more initiative to go out there and make things happen. I couldn't wait for things to fall in my lap. It wasn't like high school anymore. I had to take my destiny into my own hands. And so lucky enough, um, life after school kind of changed for me a little bit after that. And so I graduated. I was level seven. I wasn't really, I wasn't where I wanted to be. It's just about, about early 2009. Um, and I graduated and I learned something else too that that day too because I, I graduated. I didn't want my I didn't want my family and friends to come because it was so weird to have them celebrate me when I felt like I slacked all throughout college. I, I slacked through a good half of it. So I was level seven, and they gave me this paper, and, it, and this paper said that you graduated, you earned it, and you are now officially an artist. You're a concept artist. You know, you did all this stuff. You earned it. But I knew in my heart of hearts that I didn't earn it, and so. My parents celebrated me. My friends celebrated me and said, good job. Congratulations. You did it. You did all these things. But again, I knew in my heart of hearts that like it, it, it wasn't what it wasn't what I earned. And so I literally went back that same day. Um, I gave a diploma to my mother because she wanted to to, you know, cherish it. But I went back to work in my gown. I went back into the lab 
And I said, no, I'm not done yet. You know, th even though I graduated, this paper doesn't mean shit. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't define me. Right. And so I was like, I have this, but it's not it's, it's not going to define me like I'll I will define myself. And so a lot of people, once they got this, they actually kind of chilled out. They said, hey, I got a job or I got my degree. I'm good. I'll supply to jobs, you know, and I'll work my portfolio here and there. But I'm going to relax. I earned it. And some of them did. But I knew that I couldn't rest until my work was good enough where someone could offer me work. So I kept working. I literally went back to school. And luckily, a company called me. I got very, very lucky with Crazy Pixel Productions, this company that a lot of people worked at that were in the area. Um, not the most glamorous company. I was working on a game called Perfumery, and I'm sure I can bring this game up right now, or it's called Passport to Perfume. And again, not the most glamorous uh, game, but it was my first game I ever got to work on, and it was silly, and it was not, again, not amazing, but, you know, it got the job done. And so I got to work on this, uh, this, this silly game, and I'll bring it up right here. This was the game that I got to work on, right? It looks terrible. I had to design all that stuff, but I took pride in it, and that was really, really important as well, that um, someone was willing to pay me, and I had to just do the best job I could. So that was my first job, and it wasn't very glamorous. It was super ugly. I actually, I actually made this, uh, this, all this stuff right here. I made like the border. I made the background. I made this person. It was, uh, it was so bad. It was so terrible. Um, but you know, I just did the best job that I could and I took pride in it because my mother taught me to take pride in anything that I do. Um, I come from a family of a uh, mom's a janitor. And so doing janitor work isn't very glamorous, but she takes pride in what her, she takes pride in what she does that whatever she's going to clean, you know, it's going to be the cleanest it, it can possibly be. And she never, um, skips out, never, never half asses it. And so, I got my job and I thought that that would complete me, right? Because now I got a job, now I'm worth something, right? Now I have a job, people will respect me, people will value my opinion, all these things are gonna happen, right? So like I reached the end, right? That was my life. Well, the company went under <laughs> and I realized that I worked super, super hard to get this job because I thought the job was gonna validate me and though graduating validated myself and getting a job validated myself, I still wanted to have the job because people would then talk to me. And that was a weird thing, too, because people would be like, oh, you work for a company? What's it like? What's going on? I was getting that that um, that praise that my friends were getting when they went to the studio. I was getting that, and it felt good. But I learned that I was maybe getting a little bit too into that kind of stuff. And so uh, it was probably good the company went under. And I thought... Well, now what, right? Because I work so hard. If I don't have a job, I'm not an artist, right? And that's and that's what I that's what I really really thought. That if I don't have a job, that I'm not worth anything. And so again, began to learn more about my life and more about myself. Um, I was able to learn that the job does not define me, right? I define me. So I began uh, to learn not to kind of compare myself to my friends not kind of compare myself to to what job I have. And most importantly, I learned not to compare myself to what level I'm at, right? And so here, my level is no longer important to me. Why? Because I don't care anymore. Because the level is just, it's just, it's just a statement, right? It's a temporary thing because you're, if you keep working at your art, you're always going to be growing. And so now I don't care. Right. At whatever level I'm at currently right now at this particular place doesn't matter to me because I know that if I keep working, it will constantly go up. And so now I'm not really in a competition with anybody or companies or artists. I'm kind of in a competition with myself. And for me, the competition is just to do good work and be happy. And that's kind of what I learned. And so, um, you know, as I'm going kind of going through this this art journey, um, I realized how much I just let other people define what I should be thinking about myself. And I learned to just be more self-confidence in myself. And so I hope that that helps you guys, um, you know, uh, when you guys are kind of going through your art journey, if you're, if you're having, if you're having that problem. And so I hope that this talk kind of, kind of helps you out and lets you know that, you know, if you're not where you want to be, it's always temporary. You know, if you put in the work, 
no matter how little time you have, you can do it. You really can. I really believe that. Because if you've ever seen my my beginning paintings to what I do now, you'll so you'll know that literally anything is impossible. And so um, what I always say is it's always kind of like just progress, not perfection, or just better than yesterday. Those are kind of things that I always um, I always say is just, you know, keep moving forward. Um, and that's what kind of my blog, if, anyone, if anyone's ever been to my blog, I always say keep moving forward. Because all you can do in life is keep moving forward. And if I think if you really, you know, take that to heart and keep pushing forward, I think good things will help, will kind of come to you. And so that's why I always say <laughs> keep moving forward. And so that is the uh, kind of end of my talk. And I always say, you know, you can do it um, if you really put your mind to it. No one can know what's inside of you. And um, and that's OK. And people are going to judge you and people are going to tell things to you because they want to look out for you and they want to make sure that you don't, you know, go through things that they went through hardships. And that's totally OK. But only you can know what's inside of you. And if you look inside of yourself and you see that there's something inside of you that can do this, whether it's be an artist, animator, doctor, whatever, then don't let anyone stop you. OK. And so. With that, I want to end with some advice. And so this advice is just not anything set in stone. It's not like a Bible. It's just things that I have kind of come to learn for myself and hopefully it can help you. So let's go move forward with these. So advice. So the first advice was find out what you want to do. I want to work in games, but really find out what you want to do, right? Do you want to be an animator? Do you want to be a modeler? Do you want to be a texture artist? Do you want to be a rigger? Do you want to be a tech artist? Find out. So explore as much as you can in the beginning because you don't have a lot of time. The techniques and programs are always changing. They're always evolving. So find out what you want to do right away and just stick with that. All right. Think of it kind of like a, like a character in, in a fighting game or RPG. You kind of have like your main skill and then you're going to have a bunch of kind of side skills. But get that main skill down first. I think if you do that, You'll be in a good spot. The second thing was do not wait for information. Seek it out. What do I mean by that? Well, in my first years, right, I was waiting for people to give me information, to give me the DVD that's going to teach me how to paint, to give me the brush that's going to show me how to paint this mountain, to give me the ticket to a workshop, to give me the opportunity to get a job. Um, if there is something that you're not getting, whether it's in your class or in your life, you have to go seek the information out. We are in a time now with social media and just Google that whatever you don't know, there's no reason why you shouldn't know it because you can look it up and figure it out. It, it really is that simple. There's so many times that I've Googled like how to paint a tree, how to paint a diamond, how to use how to use 3D, how to do that, how to do this. Whatever problem you have, or whatever information you currently don't have, there's probably someone that didn't have the information before you and they found it and then they posted how they got that information. So again, do not wait for information, seek it out. When we weren't getting certain classes at my school at the Art Institute, we demanded that, that our director give us certain classes and they did. And so um, you cannot complain without trying to make it better. And that's, and that's kind of my personal opinion is that a lot of artists would complain at school. They would say, this school sucks. This school doesn't give me what I want. It doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. And I would go, okay, well, what are you gonna do to make it better? Are you gonna ask? Are you gonna go look up some teachers? Are you gonna go figure out what you guys need, they, they would say, no, I'm just going to keep complaining. And so we tried to make it better. We tried to figure out how to get what we needed. And if they didn't give it to us after that, then we raised hell, right? But you always have a choice, whether it's in school or in life. If you don't want, if you're not getting what you want from a school or a class, then just don't go anymore. You can leave. No one's forcing you guys to, to, to go to school. Um, I would hope. I would hope most parents are not forcing you to be an artist almost positive because they probably want you to be a doctor or a lawyer instead. So I'm pretty sure none of you guys are at art school because your parents made you and you hate drawing, right? If they did that, it's super cool. That's really weird to me. So again, if you're not getting information, you have to seek it out. You have to demand it. And if you're not getting what you need, then that means you have to move on, right? That's kind of like the basic loop of action that you should take. Ask for information, try to fix the problem. If you can't fix it and you see there's no possible way for you to grow as an artist or as a person, you have to leave. Same goes, same goes for companies. When you're at a company um, 
you demand certain things, you want certain things. And if you're not feeling like you can grow at that company, you have to leave and you have to go, you have to go make your life better, but you can't stick there. You can't stay there and keep complaining because nothing will ever change. So number three, do not wait for the community, create yours. Um, that's, that's a really big one. You know, we didn't have a concept art community. Um, up until like 2005, there was kind of one, but not really in Orange County. But me and AJ created a sketch group and every Wednesday we would go. And the funny part about the sketch group and how it kind of came to be was that it was just me and AJ. We would go to a Starbucks, we would go sit down outside at a bookstore in Irvine, and we would just draw and we'd invite people. And it didn't really matter who came. If it was just us two, it was fine. We would draw and would hang out. And eventually that sketch group got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that led me to meet a lot of different people that have had a positive influence in my life. And so um, a lot of people were like, yo, there's no community out here. And I'm like, well, create one. And they're like, well, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, just go to a place once a week and draw and invite people and just keep doing it. And I guarantee you, you're going to meet other people. And we got to like 70 people before I moved away. But we created our own community. Another good example is Edge Control. If you guys never seen Edge Control Expo, um, that is a art, a art workshop that is in Toronto. It happens every year in August. That was run by a couple of students of ours, a robot, a robot pencil. And they were like, man, I wish I had workshops. And I'm like, well, why don't you create one? And they did. And how they created one. And now their thing is one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest uh, workshops uh, in that area that people go to. And if I even click on it right now, and just to kind of see who's going to be there and make it big. This was created by two students that are like still in school, mind you. And to see all the people that are going to come, it's just really, really crazy to see. If I click on the event right here, I mean, just look at these badass artists that were not there before. We got Jeff Simpson, Tom Scholes, Paul Richards, Jama, Tim, Ju, uh, Jung An. Like that was an event that two years ago was never around. But because they were like, you know what, we're going to create our own community. Now it's the place to be. Now I have people asking me, hey, are you going to Edge Control? Are you going to Toronto? It's a community that was already there, but they just created it. So if you want to build that community, just, just do it. Just create something. It could be small. It can be big. It can be, it can be whatever you want. Granted, not everyone's going to have the money to kind of create their own workshop, but like you can do something like if you really, really put your mind to it. So that's, that's definitely like a big one for me, especially if you want to get jobs. Um, you know, when, when, when companies come out to schools and stuff like that, they're not going to go to a school or go to a place to look for artists if there's only one good artist. And so that's where a community really, really helps. If you have a community of badass artists that are always hanging out, it's going to attract more people. And that's why they now have sponsorships. They now have people coming looking for artists because they're all hanging out there. So the more that you try to share your information and the more you try to uplift your community, um, the more attention it gets, the more you can attract other companies, other sponsors, all kinds of things that will help you guys grow and, and help you, you know, you know, climb the ladder of whatever your career might be. And so that's really, really important is, is community. I really, really believe that. And the number, number four is stay stubborn, but be respectful. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, to me, again, a lot of people told me in school that I should not be a concept artist. They said, Kalen, I don't think this is for you. I think you should do something else. I think you should be a, an environment artist or a texture artist, which to me is actually kind of offensive to texture artists because everyone always tells me that just be a texture artist is easy. Being a texture artist is actually freaking hard. So I'm not sure why they thought that that would be harder than a concept artist. Maybe because there's more texture art jobs per se or more environment art jobs, but I'm like, dude, they're all equally hard. And so don't let people like tell you to do other things because it's easier. Everything is freaking hard. Whether you're a texture artist, you're an environment artist, you're a character artist, everything is hard. So if you go into a line of work because it's easier, because there might be more opportunities, just because there are more opportunities doesn't mean that these people are going to like be less picky about who they can get. And I'm sorry for spelling respectful, Rod, and just imagine that to be a, imagine there to be a C in there. Um, but just because there are more opportunities, it's just because a company may need 10 environment artists and two concept artists doesn't mean they're going to be, be less picky about their environment artists. It doesn't mean the company's going to be like, well, I guess we can hire a shitty one because we have 10 of them, right? No, they're going to want the best of the best. And you still have to compete with a lot of environment artists, even though there's only, even though there's only two 
constant positions. So everything is hard. So don't let people kind of steer you away to an easier path because you think it's going to be like an easier way to get a job. Everything's hard to get. Everything you got to fight for it. You have to fight as hard as you can to get a job if you really want to get one in this industry. So don't think that there's a there's a, there's a road that's easier. Now, there may be some stepping stones you got to do, which is taking jobs that, that you may not like. But again, the competition is always fierce. So don't ever think that it's going to be easier. So when I say stay stubborn, again, it's because people told me that I couldn't do it. They said, you can't do it. And they were right at the time, right? When I was level four, if you look, if you look at level four, Kalen, and you said, Kalen, you can't do concept art, I would be like, yeah, you're, you're very much right. But again, no one can know what's inside of you except for you. So I say, stay stubborn and be respectful. So I say, hey, I appreciate your opinion, but go screw yourself, right? That's, that's kind of what it means. It's saying, I appreciate you looking out for me. I appreciate that you care about me enough to give me your opinion and tell me that you think I should do this, but I know what's inside of me. I know I can do this. I just need time. So I'm going to keep doing it. And so people were kind of not that happy about my decision to keep doing concept art because they're like, dude, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're not going to get a job. You're going to be poor. And so that's a valid concern. People, that's a valid concern. If I had a son or a kid and they wanted to do this, I'd be like, I'm not sure if I want to do this because if they fail, they're going to hit, they're, they're going to hit rock bottom. And that's, and that's definitely um, a, a, a fear that I have to this day. But that fear shouldn't be what stops me from doing something that I really, that I really, really love because I love painting. Like I think about it all the time. And it's become something that I've really just come to enjoy in my day-to-day -day life. And so I have to say, I have to stay stubborn and say, you know, thank you guys for all your, for, for your worries and your concerns, but I know I can do this. So stay stubborn, but be respectful to other people because you don't want to be a dick. If you're a dick, people won't help you. And luckily those people that were, that were telling me not to do stuff, they now are willing to help me because they now see that I can do it. And so I could be kind of petty and be like, well, you didn't believe in me when I couldn't do stuff, so screw you. But at the same time, I can't, I can't fault them because they were right at the time, but they're not right anymore. So now when they say my name, they got to put some respect on it. So stay stubborn and be respectful. Number five is be prepared to walk this journey alone. Take help if offered, ask for help when needed. Now, this is a big thing that I kind of learned as I became a teacher was that um, uh, the first part was when I became a student was I had to be prepared that people would, would, would probably be too busy for me. That AJ and Nino and Edgar and Mio, all those guys would be too busy doing their own thing, that I can't rely on them to give me information. I can't rely on them for paint overs. I can't rely on my teachers. I can't rely on anybody, which sounds like kind of a very sad thing, but it, it was very true for me that if the moment I began to rely on someone, the moment I gave myself an out, I didn't make it. So I go, oh, it's their fault because if they would have gave me that brush, if they would have gave me that DVD, um, you know, I, I would have succeeded. But again, when I was prepared to walk the journey alone, I said, okay, I need to make sure that I have a plan to do this no matter what. So if I don't have anybody in this world to help me, no teachers, no school, no whatever, that I can still be a concept artist, right? So I had to have that plan in place that if the worst case scenario that I'm like dirt poor, that I can't do anything, like I get kicked out of my house or whatever, that I still have a plan to be a concept artist, right? That was my worst case scenario. So be prepared to walk the journey alone if need be, okay? Take help if offered. So that means that when someone says, hey, um, I have a brush that can help you, or hey, mind if I give you some advice? Or, hey, um, there's this person I think you should meet. This might help you get better at your work. Or, hey, you should go to this event. I have tickets. Um, take the help if offered because usually people don't, don't offer help unless they want to help you. <laughs> um, and ask for help when needed. And that's actually a big one, too, is that some people kind of always don't want to ask for help because they want to learn on their own, which is totally valid. But, again, whatever problem you're going through, chances are there was an artist long before you that went through the same problem and solved it and has a way of solving it that could make your life easier. So again, be prepared to walk the journey alone. Don't rely on anyone. Don't So don't make excuses for why you can't do something. But if someone asks you for help, hey, take it. I had a lot of doors open for me in my time. And it'd be silly of me to say, no, I'm going to do it on my own, right? I'm going to walk it alone. No, I'll walk it alone if need be, right? Ask for help. If they say no, you say, all right, cool. 
it doesn't bother me because I still have my plan, right? And if someone offers me some help, I go, sure. It makes me get to my destination a little bit quicker. You know what I mean? It's like someone giving you a ride home, right? Yeah, you can walk home. That's totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. But if someone, someone offers you help, then take it. And if you need help, don't be afraid to ask. No one is perfect here. We all need help from time, whether it's advice, whether it's, you know, money or friends or someone to listen to. We all need help from time to time. Don't be afraid to ask for that help, but don't rely on it. Okay. That's really, really important. And the last one is, is pretty simple. It's don't be an asshole and have fun and don't be a dick. You're right. And that's pretty simple to understand, but you'd be surprised. Some people kind of forget that. Just be nice to everybody. Um, be nice, be thoughtful, be kind. Um, one of the cool things about our, our art community is that uh, everyone comes from different walks of life, whether you're gay, straight, fat, skinny, um, I guess trans, transgender, that's one of them, right? Goth, Muslim, Christian, like it doesn't matter. Um, what, what matters is what, what we put on paper is how we draw and how we treat other people. So don't be a dick because this industry is very, 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 very small. And that stuff travels and it will and it can kind of stick on you for a long time. So even if you think you're being a dick to someone that you think won't be successful, you never know, man. That person could suddenly get better. And there were people that were dicks to me, that were assholes to me when I was young, when I was level three. And now I'm at a higher level than them. And it's like, it's kind of funny. Like, granted, I'll still be nice to them. But I know for a fact they were like, well, I can be mean to him because I don't think he's going to succeed. Don't ever do that. Just treat everyone just how they should be deserved to be treated. And so I make this a kind of a common thing that whenever I meet someone, I, try, I don't ask where they work. I don't ask what their portfolio is. If they're cool, we can kick it, right? I'm not going to look at you like a, like a potential job opportunity. I don't, don't want to do that. I want to just look at the person for who they are as a person. If they're cool and they're nice and they're kind, they want to make the world a better place, then we can hang out. Yes, the art may not be there. But who knows? Because next year, that person could be the person that's taking your job. You never know. And have fun. Because honestly, if if you're not having fun with it, then why are you here? Like, granted, you're not going to have fun every day. You're gonna, there's going to be some days where you don't want to do art. There's going to be some days where you have to find the love in art in order to do it. But for the most part, if you don't love what you do for the, for the most part every day that you're doing it or you're not thankful for it, then, then don't do it. I've seen way too many people that went to, that went through programs of things that thought it would get them a job and make them happy. And they got there and they're like, dude, I don't want to do this. I'm, I'm not happy doing this, right? I did it because it would pay the bills. I did it because it would get me a job. But now I'm stuck doing something for 10 hours a day and I don't like it. And the worst part about it is I'm getting better at it. So now I'm getting promotions. I'm getting more money. And I'm getting further and further down this hole of doing something that I don't want to do. Um, I've had a friend that, wanted to be a concept artist but you know chose to be an environment artist because it was because he thought it would be easier then he got a job and he got really good at it but he was like dude i want to be a concept artist and i'm like well then do it he's like man i should have just kept i should have just stuck with it but i took the route that i thought would be the easiest and i have people that you know quit concept art and became other and took other took other things they said you know what kaylin art isn't fun for me anymore it's just, it's become this job and i don't want to do it so i'm going to get a day job doing something else and i'm going to do art for myself now and that's totally fine too. Um, what you're going to have to realize is that happiness is different for everybody. What you define as happy success is not the same as for, for me as it is for you. Your happiness might be, you know, doing some small comics for yourself on Patreon. Someone else's happiness may be working for a AAA studio. Someone else's happiness may be, I want to teach at IFCC or Trojan Horse and, and be in front of thousands of people. Everyone has their idea of what makes them happy and what defines them as success. Um, it's important that you define that for yourself. That's a, that's a really, really important thing. And so some, someone once told me this before was that um, they said, I was climbing the ladder to success only to realize that I put it against the wrong wall. Uh, that, 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 that's like a very like super telling statement to say that I'm climbing this ladder to success and happiness only to realize it was on, on the wrong wall. And that, that makes a lot of sense that you have to make sure that you define what happiness and success means to you. It's very, very important because you could be doing something that, that, that defines someone else's success. And then when you finally get there, you're not going to be happy. Okay. So again, don't be an asshole, have fun and just understand what success and happiness means to you. That will change over time. So don't be afraid if that happens. Um, but again, out of all these things, it's just have fun. 
And so that concludes the end of my talk. Um, again, this is one that I've done um, for many years across the board to, to artists that are just starting out. Um, if this has helped you, if this has had a positive um, reinforcement or it just resonates with you, I encourage you to share this. This is a free thing. And um, in the meantime, I'm just looking forward to what um, this this next chapter in my life of being married and doing new things has in store for me. So thank you guys so much for the, the love and support that has been there since friggin' 2005. And um, again, so a, a positive reinforcement that it's going to be hard, but you guys can do it if you really put your mind to it. Until next time, I will see you guys around. My name is Kalen Chalk. Take care. And as always, peace.